Friends, welcome once again to our online worship here at the First Baptist Church of Freehold. I am Reverend Jonathan Elsonson, and I am so glad that you have decided to join us on this Communion Sunday at the beginning of what we refer to in the church as Ordinary Time, the time that carries us from Pentecost until the beginning of the new Christian year when we begin Advent once again. So join us during this long season when we reflect on old stories and the meaning they have for our lives. Join us this morning as we come together to worship God. So let us lift up the name of our God. Let us praise the faithfulness of the Lord. For just as the Lord's greatness fills the heavens, the Lord's love embraces the earth. Preserving our life in the midst of trouble, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Our first hymn this morning is Great God of Every Blessing.
have several announcements from here at the church this week. Uh, the first is that uh, I'm going to be out of the office during the middle part of the week. I plan on working a half day on Tuesday and then heading up to New England to uh, get my mom following her knee surgery and bring her down for recuperation here in New Jersey. So Tuesday afternoon, definitely Wednesday, and definitely Thursday, I will be out of the office. I hope to be back around on Friday and for the weekend. I'll sure be with folks for service next week, but uh, I just wanted to let you know if you need something from me, uh, please offer me a little bit of grace in uh, response time. Next Sunday, uh, our trustees will be holding their meeting, so uh, if you're watching this and on the trustee board, please join us in worship or reach out to Ross to see if there's some other accommodation that can be made. Uh, the Borough of Freehold is planning a garden walk for the 27th of June. Uh, it's the last Sunday of the month. Uh, details are still being worked up, but it'll be a self-directed walking tour of the borough with a map of some uh, exquisite local garden. So if you're interested in that, uh, take a gander over on our Facebook page as we'll post the information as it becomes available. I'd imagine something will come out sometime this week. And finally, uh, our youth were supposed to be cleaning the garden beds in front of the church in preparation for mulching, and that has actually been postponed to next weekend. So members of the youth families, we hope to see you on the 12th. So with all of that said, uh, I'd like to take some time now to speak to our young people. One of my favorite things about the Bible is that it tells stories that are very easy to understand. Now, sometimes they can be hard to understand because the language is complicated or because they're making a point that requires us to think, but the characters in them are easy to recognize. Our story today is about an uncle and a nephew named Abraham and Lot. And the story is about a conflict that they have. Now, I know some of you have brothers and sisters or friends you play with at school, and while you may love in your family and your friends, sometimes you come into conflict with them. So this is a story about how they handle their conflict. Abraham had lots of cattle, sheep, goats, silver, and gold. Abraham's nephew Lot also owned many sheep, goats, and cattle. Lot and Abraham hired shepherds to take care of their animals, and the shepherds started fighting. There wasn't enough land for all the animals. Abraham said, let's not fight. Lot, look at all the land. Choose a place to live. Then I will move in the other direction. Lot looked around and said, I like the Jordan River Valley. It's pretty and green and has good grass and plenty of water for my animals. Abraham said, then you should move to the Jordan River Valley. Abraham went to live in the Hebron Valley. God said to Abraham, I will give you land as far as your eyes can see, and I will also bless you with a very large family. So rather than fighting over their resources, Abraham and Lot decided to move a little bit apart so that they could both have enough land and resources for their animals. They made an adult decision, they made a very wise decision not to fight when they would both be hurt by that, but simply to separate. So sometimes God asks us to step away from the things that we think we want so that God can give us something else. God promises Abraham when he settles down in the Hebron Valley that he will give him lots of land and lots of animals and lots of wealth. So by giving up on the Jordan Valley, something that he liked, something that he wanted uh, to possess, he was given something new and a promise of something more. So sometimes when we have to give up on things we like, there's something better coming for us. So think about that this week, and I look forward to seeing you folks next week. Bye-bye. Friends, as we prepare to enter into a time of prayer, I have some uh, con prayer concerns uh, that were given to the church this week. Um, probably the most pressing of that is that Barbara Huff passed away last week. Uh, her service was yesterday out in Pennington, and we hold Jack and their children and grandchildren, the rest of their friends and family, in prayer in this difficult time. Uh, we have a prayer of celebration. Uh, Terry Vanacek was released home this past Wednesday. Uh, and so we continue to pray for her recovery follow following uh, her um, fractured pelvis. 
Uh, we also had some good news. Chris Tomlinson has been released from the hospital and is also recovering at home. And uh, she asked us a few weeks ago to pray for her friend Lynn, and Lynn has been found to be cancer-free. So prayers of celebration for both Chris and for Lynn. Um, Arden and Leslie go to the doctor on Monday to speak to the surgeon about removing the mass in uh, Leslie's chest. So uh, we will pray for them uh, for a positive outcome there. And Arden also asked for continued prayers for her granddaughter, Heather Harris, out in Oklahoma. Uh, Heather finally had the, uh, the bowel surgery that she needed and is recovering from that. So prayers for Heather and Leslie and Arden. We also received word this week that uh, Teresa Ely, the interim pastor who preceded me here at First Baptist, lost her mom, Odessa. So prayers for Teresa and Pete and the rest of the Ely family. And finally, as you heard me mention in the announcements, my mom is going in for shoulder replacement surgery uh, this coming Tuesday, and uh, we'll be bringing her down here for recovery. So prayers for uh, a successful surgery and an easy ride back down later this week. So with all of these prayer concerns in our minds and with whatever prayers you bear in your own hearts, let us turn now to God. Holy God, creator of life, you call us out of our dark places, offering us the grace of new life. When we see nothing but hopelessness, you surprise us with the breath of your Spirit. Call us out of our complacency and routines, set us free from our self-imposed bonds, and fill us with your spirit of life, compassion, and peace. So we turn to you now, offering up the prayers of our hearts in silence. Faithful God, we come into your presence with thanksgiving, deeply grateful for the unfailing love and faithfulness you have shown towards us, your people. When we call out to you, you answer. When we are exhausted, you give us the strength to go on. When we find ourselves in trouble, you are there, standing beside us. And so we come before you with gratitude and praise, offering you the worship of our hearts, and our lives. Open our eyes to see and to know you here among us. Open our ears to recognize your voice. Breath of life, we remember those who cry out to you today, those who long for the morning, those who are waiting for the long trial to end. We pray that our ears will be attentive to their cries, that we will stand beside them, steadfast with one another in your love which brings life that cannot be defeated by darkness or by death. We pray that you would enliven us in worship and send us out this day to live and work in the world as your faithful disciples. We ask these things in the name of our Savior Jesus, who gathered us as his own and who taught us to pray with one another, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our second hymn this morning is, What a Fellowship! What a joy divine.
Our first scripture lesson comes from the first book of Samuel. It begins in the 8th chapter and also contains uh, a coda from the 11th. Then all of the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, You are old and your sons do not follow in your ways. Appoint for us then a king to govern us like other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to govern us. Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Just as they have done to me from the day I brought them up out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so also they are doing to you. Now then, listen to their voice only. You shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel recorded all these words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen, and to run before his chariots and he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and some to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and to make implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his courtiers. He will take one-tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and his courtiers. He will take your male and female slaves and the best of your cattle and donkeys and put them to his work. He will take one-tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. The people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, No, but we are determined to have a king over us, so that we might be like other nations, and that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. Samuel said to the people, Come, let us go to Gilgal, and there renew the kingship. So all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. They sacrificed offerings of well-being before the Lord, and there Saul and all the Israelites rejoiced greatly. Our gospel lesson comes from the gospel according to Mark. The crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. When Jesus' family heard of it, they went out to restrain him, for the people were saying, He has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of demons he casts out demons. And he called to them, and he spoke to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. But his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. The crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mothers and your brothers and sisters are outside, asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Here ends our reading from God's word. May God bless and magnify it to our use.
in the life of God's people. God has led the people out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. God traveled with them in the wilderness and delivered them into the promised land. And while they were in the wilderness, God made covenant with God's people at Mount Sinai. God promises there to be their king. He says, I will be your king and you will be my people. And everything that comes afterwards, the Ten Commandments and the Torah, these are the documents, the contract that exists between God and God's people. But ultimately in that moment on top of Sinai, they make a covenant. The contracts explain the terms of the covenant, but the covenant is the agreement between God and God's people. I will be your God, you will be my people. God promises to be their king, or more properly, to stand in the place of their king, so that they do not have a king. And in that time, in that place, that was a completely unprecedented thing to happen. In that time, in that place, it was common to have kings that were revered as gods, that would be worshipped and offered tribute. But God, Yahweh, is offering a different type of relationship. God is offering to be a king, not one that is to be obeyed like an earthly master, but to be instead a covenant partner, one who cares for God's people more than any king could possibly care for their own subjects. And this episode, with Samuel and the people demanding a king, brings an end to that relationship. The covenant remains, but the people are entering into new territory. They are entering into a different type of relationship with an earthly king who will demand things of them. The law, the Torah, the Ten Commandments, there were demands there. But there were demands about righteousness and justice and how people treated one another. But Samuel tells them what this new king will require. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen. He will appoint for himself commanders of armies, some to plow his ground and reap for the harvest, to make implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his courtiers. He will take one-tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers. He will take your male and your female slaves and the best of your cattle and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take one-tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. More than anything else, knowing how bad a deal the people are willingly signing themselves up for, this reminds me of a teenager who cannot wait to move out of their parents' house. One who will quickly find out exactly how expensive it is to take care of yourself, who will learn all of the little things that they took for granted, that there would always be band-aids in the medicine cabinet, a plunger beside the toilet, extra towels, how expensive it is to buy food, how expensive it is to buy cheese, how expensive it is to buy insurance. The people of Israel have no more understanding of what this new relationship with the king will be than a teenager truly does about what life on their own, outside of their parents' home will be. The people choose to stick with their course of action, to strike off on their own, and to pledge themselves to a king who will use them for his own ends, who will take their best from them and demand ever more from them. But like that teenager setting out, sometimes they need this lesson. They need to understand who they will become as a result of the changes, obligations, and responsibilities 
they enter into. So we're going to leave Samuel for a moment and we're going to jump forward a thousand years or so to where our gospel picks up. The time of kings has come and gone. Saul gave way to David, who gave way to Solomon, and then a succession of other kings, Uzziah, Ahab, Hezekiah. They fell before Assyria and Babylon, and the people found themselves subject to Darius and Cyrus, to Alexander, and eventually to Rome, and to Rome's client king, Herod. Jesus comes to the people in Mark's Gospel to try, as Samuel did a thousand years before, to turn people back to God, to show them that God is still waiting for them, that the covenant made at Sinai excuse me, still holds. But the people do not like what Jesus has to say. They do not like the challenge to their way of life, to their chosen king, to the way that things are. They do not like the challenge to the petty tyrants that rule over them and the robber barons who exploit them. They do not like the challenge to the existing temple worship structure where people get rich restricting access to God. They cannot imagine a life outside of those small covenants they have made. So they say that Jesus cast out demons by the power of Beelzebub. Jesus' response to this charge is more than an answer to that specific challenge. We are told he spoke to them in parables, and his response is a call to return to God, to no longer be divided. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. He answers their question. How could Satan cast out Satan? But he also reminds them that they themselves, as a nation, as a people, are divided. And that nation cannot stand. He reminds them that God no longer occupies the place in their lives that God once did. Someone who unified God's people, who gave them a common purpose, who honored the covenant that was made. Remember the words we heard from Paul last week, that we are given a spirit of adoption. So that when we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness to our spirit that we are children of God. An echo of that covenant. A reminder that God stands waiting to adopt all of his people. But the crowd can't hear it. When they've had enough of Jesus' teaching, when they've had enough of his reminding them of the ways that they have wandered in their own willfulness, they try a last-ditch effort to silence them. They say, your family's here. It's time to go. And in that moment, Jesus speaks the words that give rise to Paul's later writing. The promise that we are children of God. Who are my mothers and my who are my mother and my brothers? Looking around at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Whoever does the will of God, whoever continues to honor the covenant. In a few moments we will come to a table. Of covenant. One that is built on the promise that we truly are children of God, that we are brothers and sisters and mothers of Christ. It is a time for us to remind ourselves again and again, each time we come to the table, of our dependence on God for nourishment, for strength, and for guidance. 
It is our chance to undo the choices that people made in the time of Samuel. The choices that people made when they rejected Jesus. But we are not blameless inheritors of God's covenant. Like the people in Samuel and Jesus' time, we have chosen to walk in our own ways, and we have paid prices for some of those choices. Coming to this table is a reminder of God's covenant, of our ability to return to God no matter the circumstances of our lives. But it is also a chance for us to take stock of our lives, to ask ourselves what we are returning from, what choices or attitudes or beliefs have led us astray, have led us to pledge our faithfulness to the kings of this world, kings of business, kings of politics, kings of prejudice, kings of supremacy. How, my friends, is this table asking us to give up our dependence on the kings and instead to invest in loss, to look to the places in our own lives where God is calling us to grow, and so to return to covenant. Amen. Our next hymn this morning is Simply Trusting Every Day.
Come to this table of covenant. Come to this table of promise. Come to live into the truth that God calls God's own, that God promises to journey with them through the wilderness, that God promises to feed and nourish them, to strengthen them for the journey ahead, and that God calls such as these God's own children. Come to this table, not because you feel it is your right, but because you know that you need to journey back towards God, to dwell in God's peace, to dwell in God's love, to dwell in God's promise. So come, friends, to the table. On the night that he was betrayed, we are told that Jesus shared a final meal with his disciples. And during the course of that meal, he took a loaf of bread and he gave thanks for it. And he broke it, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Each time you eat of it, do so in remembrance of me. So we who are Christ's disciples in this age, eat the bread of life, and we remember. similar fashion, following the meal, Jesus took a cup, and again, after giving thanks for it, he offered it to his disciples, saying, This cup is a new covenant poured out in my life's blood for the forgiveness of sin. Each time you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. So we, who are Christ's disciples in this age, drink the cup of salvation, and we remember Friends, by this meal we are fed. By this meal we are made whole. By this meal we are prepared to go out into the world and share the promise of God's love with a world that is in need of its hearing. We are also told that before they departed, Jesus and the disciples sang a hymn with one another before departing. So I invite you now to enjoy our closing hymn, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds.
Friends, may you go into the world with assurance, hope, and promise. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ rest upon you, and even perhaps unsettle you. May the love of God, the creator and giver of our life, embrace you, and even confront you. And may the presence of the Holy Spirit encourage you and surprise you this day and all your days. Go in peace, friends.